Good afternoon, and welcome to today's Roads and Bridges webcast, Improving Roadway Worker Protection Through Resources and Legislation, sponsored by the American Traffic Safety Services Association, more commonly known as APSA. I'm Ryan Curtis with Endeavor's Building and Construction Group, and I will be moderating this session. Today's topic is rather significant considering the alarming statistics that the National Work Zone Safety Information Clearinghouse shared for 2021. According to them, there were an estimated 106,000 work zone crashes and 956 lives lost in work zone fatalities that year. Before we dive into what you can do to prevent such tragedies, let me explain how you can participate in today's presentation. If you encounter any technical difficulties, simply type your issue into the Ask a Question box and a member of our team will assist you. You can also click on the question mark help button in the upper right hand corner of the screen. We encourage your active participation throughout the event. While we address as many questions as possible during the Q&A session following the main presentation, please feel free to submit your questions at any time. Once again, all you have to do is type your questions into the Ask a Question box and click the Send button. Also, please note that today's session is being recorded and will be made available on the Roads and Bridges website within the next week. You'll be notified via email when the archive is available. Now, let's meet today's speakers. Donna Clark will be, will be kicking off today's web chat. She is the Vice President of Education and Technical Services for APSA. Alex uh, Vusilic will be presenting after Donna. Alex serves as the Vice President of Business Development for WD Wright Contracting, Inc. Now, let me turn things over to our first presenter. Donna, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alex, uh, or Ryan, I appreciate that. Um, as Ryan said, my name is Donna Clark, and I am the Vice President of um, Education and Technical Services for ATSA. I've been with them for about 26 years. And um, the, the issue of uh, worker safety is very important to me. Um, it, it's one of the reasons I focus on training. Um, so I appreciate the time uh, today to, to talk to you about this issue. And I hope we are able to give you some good information. So let's, with that, let's just jump right into it um, with a survey question. Um, if you could go ahead and answer this question for me, I'd like to know if you know of someone who has been killed or injured um, in a work zone. So if you could answer that for me, I would appreciate it. Okay, it looks like about 70% of you um, know someone who has been um, killed or seriously injured in a work zone incident. Um, let me go back here and I have one more question for you. Have you personally had a near hit while working in a work zone? So go ahead and answer that one for me. Almost 100% of you said yes. Um, so that's what we're dealing with. That's why we're here today. That's why this um, subject that we're talking about is so important. Um, so what's the issue? We just talked about it. Who's at risk and how can we help? So let's talk about that. Um, here's the statistics. Um, as you can see, they're pretty steady for the last few years. I checked this morning. And for 2021, there were 108 workers killed. Um, the average, every three days, a worker is killed. Uh, and that's just not acceptable. We've got to do something to stop that. Uh, and so that's what we at ATSA have been focused on for the last couple of years. Um, top causes of work zone uh, or worker fatalities is speeding, driver inattention or distracted driving, aggressive or reckless driving, impaired driving, and fatigued driving. Uh, when you guys registered, we asked the question, um, have you noticed a significant increase in uh, distracted driving over the last few years? 96% of you said yes. Um, to me, those are some very staggering um, statistics, um, and it just, to me reiterates why we need to continue our focus on worker safety. 
at ATSA, what we've done is we've created um, a Roadway Worker Protection Council, and we focus in, on four major areas, um, education and training, innovation and technical services um, or technology, um, public relations, and then legislation, which Alex is gonna talk to you about after I'm done. Uh, what we're trying to accomplish with all of these things is just creating a culture of safety throughout your entire organization. So what does that mean? What is a culture of safety? What does it mean to you? If you have any thoughts on that, what I'd like you to do is just as, as I'm talking, go ahead and type that into the Q&A um, section of your, of your um, laptop. You'll, you'll see it on the screen um, and I'll refer to those as I talk. Um, but here is the official definition of a culture of safety. It's an organization's shared perceptions, beliefs, values, and attitudes that combine to create a commitment to safety and an effort to minimize harm. So how do we create that culture of safety? What are the steps we take? What, is, what do we do? The way we approached it at ATSA is we talked about what can an organization do before an incident actually occurs to hopefully minimize that risk or at least mitigate what actually happens. As we talked about that, we came up with a list of things that we think an organization can incorporate to help mitigate that risk talking to your workers about situational awareness, making sure that there's a clear um, chain of command, um, making sure that your workers are comfortable pointing out when there's a problem with the work zone. Before they go to the work zone, making sure that they understand what the job is, what their function is gonna be, and what potential safety hazards they may um, encounter. Um, conducting safety briefings, um, doing toolbox talks, having formal and informal training. I've always been asked the question, what if we train our employees and they leave the company? You know, we invest all this money in them and they leave. So my question right back to you is, what if you don't train them and they stay? That's worse. You wanna have your employees trained and, and it's not a one, and done type deal. You train throughout their entire employment. Um, first day on the job, you give them training. And as they progress throughout the um, organization, you continue that training. And again, the training is both formal and, and informal. Um, and we have tools that can help you determine what level of training should go with um, the positions that you're trying to Phil. So we'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, the next area in creating the culture of safety is what should an organization focus on during an incident? So you want to make sure that um, management knows exactly what to do. Should there be an incident, the workers know what to do. Um, you want to make sure that you're taking care of the workers. If there's an incident, you want to get them off the road, get them back into the office and, and give them the support they need to handle whatever happened on the roadway. Um, you want to make sure that you have another crew that's ready to go out there and secure the scene and make sure that things are safe so that there isn't another incident. Um, you want to make sure that you have a process in place to re review what happened kind of do a, a debrief um, and put procedures in place to ensure that that particular incident doesn't happen again, or at least try to mitigate the risk that it'll happen again. And then the third part of that is what happens after you had an incident and you get back to the office, what do you do now? Well, you got to debrief. You've got to take care of the employees. Um, if, the, if it's a fatality, you've got to reach out to the family and offer assistance. Um, at ATSA, we have a foundation arm. And one of the things that we're able to do is if there is a fatality in a work zone, we're able to offer the minor children um, 
a scholarship for um, higher education. So um, as an organization, you want to make sure you have things in place um, to take care of the employees, but also to make sure that you're reaching out to families to make sure that they're taken care of. You want to make sure that you're doing job debriefs. You want to make sure that your workers are comfortable pointing out um, unsafe issues in a work zone. I, many people have said to me, you know, we just have to put the work zone out and we're not responsible for um, making sure that it's safe or, um, you know, if, if the general contractor or whoever tells us to do something, we have to do it. That's true to a certain extent, but if you're being told to do something that you know is unsafe or incorrect, um, you have an obligation to speak up, um, and your organization has an obligation to make sure that there's a safe environment, that you are comfortable speaking up, and that they will address your concerns and issues. Um, so one of the things we're doing at ATSA is we're trying to help companies um, create this culture of safety. And uh, what we've done is we've created a worker protection toolkit, and we've got some items in it already, and we'll be adding more as we get them developed. But what we have in, in the toolkit so far is a work zone terminology guide for new employees. So if you're just completely new to roadway work and you don't know the terminology, uh, you, you need some help with that. So we've created a little guide to help you with that. Uh, we've created incident response checklist and those checklists checklist covers exactly what I just went through. What do you do before an incident? What do you do during an incident? And once, what do you do once an incident has occurred? Um, the, and those checklists um, are very thorough and they give you a lot of detailed information. Uh, we've also created um, a training guide so that your organization can set up training for you based on uh, the job that you do and then the level that you're at within the organization. And it's just a guide to help you, you as the employee and the organization ensure that you're continuing to get that training as you progress throughout your career. All of these handouts um, are available on our website. Um, they're currently free to add to members and um, non-members um, can receive a 50% discount using the code that you see up on the screen. Um, I think it's like 1250 for these documents. And we'll be adding to them um, as we get other items developed. And here's some of the other things that we're looking at developing. Uh, we're developing training specifications. So if you are um, a traffic control technician, here's the tr type of training that you re should receive. This is what the content should, take a, should look like. If you are a traffic control supervisor, a flagger, uh, a pavement marking installer, a sign installation um, installer, any of those things, we kind of detail what should be included in that training and we provide it to state DOTs. If they want to institute a training specification, they can use what we've provided. Uh, we're also um, looking at developing um, some training for um, safety pers person incident response and situational awareness, and also how to set up a model safety training program and creating that culture of safety within your organization. Um, so I'm really excited about um, all of the things that our Roadway Worker Protection Council is doing. I, I think that they will be helpful for our, our industry and um, help to at least mitigate some of these um, dangerous situations that we sometimes find ourselves in. Um, if anybody wants more information on any of the things that they, I've talked about today or that you see on the screen right now, um, you can reach out to me and I will be happy to uh, let you know, you know where we're at with the development of, of these items. 
Um, but this is an important subject and one that is not, in my opinion, a one and done. We, this is something that we need to continue to work on. And I look forward to working with all of you uh, to reduce those stats. And um, I'm gonna stop right now and turn it over to Alex. And then at the end, we'll be um, ready to answer any questions that you may have. So thank you for your time, I appreciate it. Thanks, Donna. Um, as Ryan said, my name is Alex Vuslich. Uh, I made a joke to Ryan earlier that people butcher my last name. And uh, if Ryan was a telemarketer, I would have known it right from the outset. So, um, but again, thanks, Ryan. Um, thanks, Jody Gordon, for putting this on, uh, for inviting me to speak here. Really do appreciate it. Um, and I want to thank Donna as well, uh, especially. I was going to save it for the end, uh, and I'll try to tie this back up at the end as well. But um, making my pitch for ATSA, uh, again, everything that I'm going to talk about here, it could not have been. Uh, couldn't have couldn't have occurred if it wasn't for uh, ATSA and then giving us uh, the platform in, in which to congregate with uh, constituents like uh, and fellow roadway workers. So, uh, again, thanks to Donna and to ATSA for, again, helping to organize this and for for all the help that they've provided along the way. I'm going to name some specific people uh, along the way uh, from ATSA. Um, but what I really want to do, guys, is is tell you about my experience. And again, Donna and I didn't really coordinate too many of our slides prior to this. Jody did a great job of helping to facilitate it and kind of make sure that we're on the same page and obviously choosing the topic of this. But uh, it was really interesting. I hadn't heard her speech before this, but again, going through there, there were six or seven slides that were kind of exactly the experience that I had uh, going through some of the situations that we did and she's spot on with every one of them. I couldn't agree with her more on uh, the things that she was spoken about and advocating for. So um, what I want to do, though, is kind of give you some color and some context to each of those points that she'd brought up and let you know um, how um, how that kind of plays out in real time. Uh, so, again, my name is Alex Fuslich. Um I'm the vice president of business development for WD Wright. Just some background on WD Wright. And again, please don't find me arrogant or, uh, again, trying to pitch my wares here or, you know, uh, WD Wright too much. I just want to kind of give you guys an idea of who we are as a company uh, so that maybe you guys can find some of these relatable. Um, WD Wright is a family owned and operated company. It was started in 1977 by Dave and Lori Wright. Dave was a lineman by trade. I uh, used to work up and down the East Coast uh, working with Bell Atlantic. We used to try to find different traffic controls, com traffic control companies to keep him safe whenever he was out on the road. Um, if anybody showed up at all, they were either late or on drugs. So we decided to develop an in-house program. Uh, it's something that we've really been able to start exporting heavily in the last 15 years, um, working with the likes of Columbia Gas, Duke Energy, Dominion Energy, Verizon. Um, Again, we've as we've grown within traffic control, uh, we've stayed abreast of the changes of the industry. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of people on here right now that can relate to the bad old days uh, whenever traffic control was low men on the totem pole, go out and stick his hands up and pray to God that the cars stopped. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people got hurt and injured that way and killed, again, as we attested to earlier uh, in this call. So... Um, We've tried to stay abreast of those changes and, again, try to keep up with them. Um, specifically, you know, all of our flaggers are ATSA certified. You know, we make sure that they're given that full ATSA course uh, and then, you know, given an extra day of just WD Wright specific training as well. Um, unfortunately, um, we found out that you can train for all the different scenarios uh, that you want um, and sometimes still bad things happen. And um, that experience has really kind of been driven home to me uh, over the last uh, couple of years. Um, I'm here today because of a man uh, by the name of Josh Bishop. Josh was a flagger out of our York, Pennsylvania office. Uh, he was killed on May 14th, 2020, when a driver fell asleep behind the wheel uh, and struck and killed Josh. The police affidavit said that the driver's last conscious memory was two blocks prior to the point of impact. Um, no brakes were applied prior to um, the driver striking and killing Josh. Um, 
just a little bit of background on who Josh was. He was a three tour of duty veteran uh, in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, for my lack of military understanding and terminology, he was a minesweeper. Uh, he would um, disable IEDs uh, along the roadways that are uh, serving men and women would travel uh, and trying to uh, protect them and keep them safe. Uh, unfortunately, he had to come home to York, Pennsylvania to lose his life and leave behind a mother, a wife, and three small children. When I met with Josh's mom and wife, Felicia, um, Felicia said something that still sticks with me to this day, and um, I wanted to share with you. She basically said, uh, flagging and traffic control was really the first job that Josh had felt right in since coming home. Uh, as having a couple of friends who've served and came back, uh, I can attest, as I'm sure a lot of people can on this call, as far as uh, some of the troubles that people have coming back, acclimating to society. Um, and again, this was, she, Felicia said that this job was the perfect combination of safety and service. Um, and when I really kind of thought about that and, and was just kind of left with my own thoughts, you know, in a perfect scenario and in the best sense, uh, that's really what flagging kind of boils down to. Uh, and to say that we lost a good one uh, when we lost Josh was an understatement. Um, people don't have to, you know, people say a lot of things in grief. Um, I can attest to that as well. Uh, but she, Felicia didn't have to say that. And you know, the fact that she did uh, stirred in me and in Brian Wright, the president of the company, and then the Wright family as a whole, that something needed to change, you know, um, being in ops for a number of years, um, I would talk to different flaggers and, and hear their levels of frustration whenever they would talk about errant drivers disregarding them or being rude or, um, again, just ag aggressive more often than not. Um, we would always coach people, you know, have a pen and paper so that you can write down the license plate number of a driver that, you know, again, either endangers you or disregards your guidance. Um, and then we could turn that into the local authorities after the fact. Um, Again, frustration would grow as nothing was done. Um, some of the research that we did uh, and around this topic, we found that you know flaggers basically had less authority out there than an inanimate object. Um, there's laws on the books. If Donna decides to run through a DOT sanctioned stop sign, there's clear laws on the books that say, hey, you are subsequent to X, Y, Z fines and penalties. Um, not so much for flagging. Some states are better than others, I won't lie, you know, just in doing some of the research around the country. Um, some are ahead of others, some are further behind. Uh, and some of that is due to us, that's our own fault. You know, I think that, you know, for a long time, traffic control was considered the Wild West. Um, my level of frustration does grow as I drive around and I see that not all flagging crews are created equal. Um, you'll see certain industries that will just go out there and. Whether their folks have hat, hard hats on or not, doesn't seem to matter. Whether they throw two cones out or three cones out, let alone a 50 to 150 foot taper of six cones, uh, doesn't seem to be relevant. And that becomes frustrating, especially when, when uh, companies like the ones on this call right now are held to a certain level of standard. So um, again, it, it's, it's on us to get better as an industry. And that's where, again, like legislating and, and, and trying to raise the bar of what's expected um, has become such a passion project for us here at WD Wright and for myself as well. Um, in looking at how do we approach, so we had this tragic event happen to us. And again, we're not going to sit on our hands. We're not just going to say, oh, well, them's the brakes. You know, what are we going to do? Um, you know, what we, we decided that, you know, how do we look at this? Do we mount a, you know, a public relations campaign? You know, do we go out and take to the airwaves and, and say, well, we found that that's already kind of been done. You know, it's hard to drive through, you know, on a major highway these days and not see, you know, cute little children on billboards saying, please slow down. My daddy works here, you know, in hard hats and safety vests. Um, again, so we decided we wanted to approach it from a different way. And again, reaching out through ATSA and again, having been uh, as a member of ATSA for going on eight years now. Uh, I knew the resources that were available to us, you know, just from being involved in the Pennsylvania chapter. Um, and again, you know, we were lucky enough to run into a, a young woman by the name of Renee Gibson, who is ATS's government relations on a state level. Um, she was kind of our shepherd through all of the bureaucracy that is government. 
and uh, you know, trying to find us to get to the right people and, and helping to you know, say, okay, hey, here's how you do it. Um, she also kind of helped us temper some of our speech. Uh, as you can tell, maybe I'm not the most refined uh, person, but I certainly have uh, passion out the wazoo. So if I got anything going for me, maybe it's that. Um, but she would also be able to say, hey, Alex, you know, don't go in there and make it sound like you want to deputize flaggers either, because I think if you start talking to lawmakers about, you know, you want to give flaggers X, Y, Z uh, types of authority out there, you may be met with uh, a certain level of pushback. So um, she helped us kind of guide our way, you know, in, in talking with Renee, you know, we were talking about, hey, what do we want this to look like? Um, and we, you know, we came in with the idea that, you know, maybe we'll model our efforts after MAD, uh, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, um, as a way that, you know, you look at it, you know, you talk to anybody over the age of 50 and you, and you get the idea that, you know, drunk driving used to be kind of a slap on the wrist, you know, hey, police would pull you over and, you know, oh, they'll take you home, let you sleep it off or whatever, uh, Anybody who's had a DUI in the last 20 to 30 years can obviously attest to uh, how much that has changed. Uh, it's now a pariah offense. You know, it's one of those ones. It's all, it's almost worse than a scarlet letter or something like that. But, um, you know, it was one of those things where enough people had gotten killed that, you know, society decided to police itself different. And we were hoping that we could have a similar effect. Um in starting to call different senator, state senators and state representatives, I did get a bit of a civic lesson. You, know, you can bl blame our public education for that, for me not understanding the difference between a state Senate, a U.S. Senate, uh, the House of Representatives and a state re House of Representatives. But uh, I certainly did. And again, it's one of those things where as you start to weed through it, you definitely become more educated in particular ways and understanding, oh, there's committees for that. Oh, I had no idea. Uh, and, and who's the particular person that you need to get a hold of. And, and again, you really do start to find the value of staffers um, and you know, anybody that'll give you a, a time to pitch your wares. Um, and I certainly kind of came in and, and pitched it a lot, uh, calling around, trying to talk to different folks. Um, we finally felt our, found our champion uh, right here in our backyard in Western Pennsylvania by the name of a, a gentleman by the name of Elder Vogel. Uh, he's the senator of the 47th district in Pennsylvania, covering uh, the greater Beaver, Butler, and Lawrence counties. Um, he took our, you know, we worked with his staff and kind of crafting our the bill, which I'm going to go over here in a second, uh, and proposed it on June 21st of 2022. Um, it was later unfolded into Senator Wayne Langerholk, who is the uh, chairman of the Transportation Committee in Pennsylvania. Uh, he unfolded it into his Greater Drive Smart Act. Um, still trying to figure out um, if that was a huge benefit or not. Again, it helps kind of gain momentum, but I think a lot of other things maybe got jumped in front of our bill. Uh, and currently we're sitting kind of dormant, uh, which again, I'll get into in a second. But um, again, I don't want to read to adults. You know, uh, yeah, I'll leave this up here for a second, you know, so you guys can go over a little bit of the uh, specifics on uh, Senate Bill 614, but the idea is to enhance penalties for those who would disregard uh, traffic control within work zones and create, you know, greater fines for that. Um, so the, the kind of the crux to this is that we wanted to approach the penalties in three different ways. You know, say Donna decides to, um, you know, clip a flagger or, you know, basically blow by it, you know, on a, on a, or blow through their stop slow paddle and, and, and almost drive into oncoming traffic coming the opposite way because she was such in such a hurry uh, to get to work that day that she decided the laws didn't apply to her. And I'm Donna, I apologize for using you as an example on this. I just didn't have anybody else. I couldn't use Ryan next time, I guess. But um, so rather than having somebody, um, again, we wanted to, to make sure that this sunk in, that this was going to be a, an offense that you, you're going to think about. You know, you're not going to be able to just get away with a slap on the wrist. Um, so we approached it from, you know, fines uh, ranging from four hundred dollars, you know, to subsequent like, fines growing. Um, we also got into, you know, points on license um, that would increase your insurance premiums. Um, and lastly, you know, the one that I was really wanted to do because, again, I you can hurt somebody in the pocketbook, and I do think that that has quite a bit of an effect. Um, but I think that that can cut two ways. I think that. Um, we as a country probably imprison more people than maybe are necessary. And again, that's a topic for another discussion. Um, 
maybe we're not imprisoning the right people. I don't know. Again, I'm going to go off on a tangent on that one. But I also know that I don't want to put someone away for six months uh, just because they don't have the ability to pay a $400 fine. Uh, I realize there's quite a gap uh, in wealth in this country, and I'm not here to talk about that. But uh, I also don't want someone to be able to stroke a check and absolve themselves of their sins, you know, just because you know somebody thinks that they're more important than you know the men and women standing on the side of the road. Uh, I don't want them to be able to get away scot free on this either, just because they they have the money to be able to do it. So uh, the other thing was going to be a remedial class. Um, this was going to basically require uh, again approved through the Pennsylvania DOT. Uh, and again, they're working through currently, uh, we're working with PennDOT and the Turnpike on divide, uh, creating a driver's education course uh, that's focused toward more towards students, but again, we find is going to be pretty applicable across the board. Um, and again, make somebody come in on a Saturday, sit for six to eight hours and, and really consider what they've done. So um, those are kind of the, some of the um, efforts that we're trying to do from a penalty standpoint. Um, you know, at this current time, uh, we have come to a bit of a stalemate, unfortunately. Uh, it didn't get passed last year. Um, so I've been trying to uh, be a bit of pain in the butt uh, in the senator's office, just kind of calling and seeing, oh, when are we next, guys? When are we Is this going to come back? Uh, but again, uh, rather than just kind of sitting and being a pain, I was just trying to be proactive. So um, again, we've proposed it on the Senate side. Um, you know, if you talk to Renee, or anybody in government relations with that, so they'll, they'll probably tell you, you know, passing legislation is a four to six year endeavor. Um, I don't have the patience for that, especially when, you know, like the stats that Donna went over earlier, you know, X amount of people are dying a day because of this. Are you kidding me? You know, then we're, we're just going to sit and, you know, let this kind of continue to happen. Um, so, Again, we're trying to run a simultaneous bill in the House of Representatives as well as try to get this passed in the Senate. Uh, again, you know, trying to reach out to folks in Pennsylvania's uh, House of Representatives and the Transportation Committee haven't been welcomed with open arms. So again, um, this is where the collaborative nature of this really helps. Uh, and again, you know, being a part of ATSA and being to be able to go to chapter meetings uh, and share ideas and kind of pull resources uh, is a huge help. You know, you, you talk to enough people, so-and-so knows so-and-so. Uh, and that's where it really helps. And we're trying to kind of, you know, pull as many strings as we can uh, and create those kind of connections uh, and see if we can't get some help uh, on the legislative side. Uh, in Ohio, we're going to try to run this as well, that being the neighboring state to us. Um, just this past week, uh, I met with Representative Gary Click out of the Fremont, Ohio district. Um, he is going to be sending this almost like a, a, co a copy-paste version of Senate Bill 614 out to his colleagues looking for co-sponsorship. It's going to be given a House bill number, uh, and then it's probably going to sit idle until the fall uh, whenever committee assignments are assigned and, and they can kind of pick up these efforts and kind of go. We're also working with uh, Senator Bill Reinecke out of the same area in Ohio to try to, again, run a companion bill in the Senate. Uh, so if we run it in the Senate and we run it in the House and the two ultimately need to approve each other, um, we're trying to cut down on some of that legwork so that by the time one gets passed in one or the other, um, by the time it's ready for ratification, the last side will say, yes, I've seen this before. We're good with this. We've worked this all out. Uh, and it'll cut down on that four to six year timeline. Uh, in closing, um, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for Josh Bishop. Um, his family, and especially his children and wife, uh, continue to be in my prayers uh, and in the thoughts uh, of the leadership here at WD Wright. Uh, it remains a motivating factor for everything that we do uh, and the education that we distribute to our folks um, and the standard that we hold ourselves to. Um, again, uh, it's he's a constant inspiration and something that... Um, you know, he was evidence that something has to change, therefore something will change, um, or I'm going to do it until they no longer let me in the house anymore. So um, with that, I think we're going to turn it over to questions and answers. Um, we'd love to, to hear from you guys and, and see what you thought and um, what questions you have for us. Well, awesome. Thank, uh, thanks to both of you. That, that was a great presentation. Um, now, a few of you have already submitted questions, so we're going to jump right in. 
Uh, and just a reminder, if you'd like to submit a question, just simply type your question into the Ask a Question box and hit the Send button. So uh, question number one is, should an employer offer both formal training and informal training? Um, yeah, I'll take that one if you don't mind. And, uh, you know, the answer is absolutely. Um, as I uh, stated earlier, um, you start training on day one and you don't, in that employee's training until the final day that they are employed with you. Um, and it is vitally important that we do both very formal training, such as the type we offer at ATSA and National Safety Council and some others, uh, but also informal training, uh, which means um, safety briefings and toolbox talks and you know things like that, but also in the language that you use every day. So use every single opportunity um, as a learning opportunity. Uh, both formal and informal and ongoing training is vital. Perfect. Um, Alex, what has been the most difficult aspect of this process? Um, yeah, I don't want to beat a dead horse. I'm sure you guys heard it in my presentation. Um, kind of the, the, the slow wheels of bureaucracy um, and the way that things kind of um, everybody, you know, needs to check with somebody else on something. And, and again, too, that's, I, I, you know, again, please forgive me if I, if I sound arrogant on this, I know that, you know, I'm not the most important thing. And again, this bill is probably, you know, there's other things that do take precedence over this. Um, and again, too, you know, there's a reason that everything is vetted and, and kind of taken into account. Um, but again, yeah, it's just the, the, the start and stop nature of it as well. You know, again, you ATSA has meetings once a quarter and it's great to kind of go back there. And I feel like I'm really letting the team down every time I go back and they ask any updates, Alex. And I continue to have to just say, sit and waiting guys We're waiting to get back from so-and-so. Um, so that's again, where it's, it's kind of made me a little bit kind of scattershot and, and trying to, you know, get smaller victories along the way. Um, and, and as well as, like I said, kind of diversify our look outside of just, hey, just placing all of our eggs in the Senate basket of Pennsylvania or the Senate basket or the House of Representative basket for Pennsylvania. Sure. Um, Donna, this question says, has this been shared with the chapter liaisons uh, or chapter presidents? Um, yes, we've done um, some promotion on on the um, the toolkit. Um and um, there is a slide in their presentations that the staff liaisons give when they go to the chapter meetings that promotes the, um, the Work Zone Resource Toolkit. Uh, but if anybody wants any specific information, they certainly can reach out to me. Perfect. Um, Alex, since the bill hasn't passed into law as of yet, what have been the small victories that you've savored? Um kind of misery loves company, I guess. Um, you, when I first approached ATSA, I looked at it as, as a competitive thing. You know, I, I saw other flagging companies in there and I would think, um, I don't want to give away any trade secrets here. And then you kind of come to find out that there probably are new, new ideas under the sun. You know, nobody has, you know, the secret bullet that they're you know, sitting on or anything like that. Um, and then you start to you start to collaborate and you start to kind of grow and, and you know you ask what's the small victory I think the the, the small victory is just kind of seeing that we're not alone that uh, other people are dealing with the same level of frustration and danger and um, and we're all kind of in it together and, and that does give me hope like I said there, there should be a change, therefore there will be a change. And, and I don't think the people on this call, just by testimony of them being here again at 2.39 on a, you know, on a work day, you know, they're taking time out to kind of hear and, and educate themselves on, on what they could be doing to make their organizations better, um, which again tells me there's, there's a passion out there and, and, and we're gonna find a way to make, to utilize that. Perfect. Um, oh man, uh, I'm afraid we've run out of time for today. Uh, so for those questions we didn't have time to answer, we'll be getting back to you via email. And that concludes today's webcast.
On behalf of Roads and Bridges, I'd like to thank Donna and Alex for their fascinating presentation, AFSA for sponsoring today's event, and of course, all of you for joining. Have a great rest of the day.